All right, Graham, take it away. All right, all right let me just uh, move all the camera people to this side. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So let me go ahead and share. Ryan, you give me the thumbs up if that's working. There you go, bud. All right, cool. So tonight we're going to talk about Uncle Oscar and Aunt Frances Elwell um, and their 50 years of service. Now, we have a lot to go through, but what I want to do is just remind everybody sort of who I am and how uh, how I do uh, some of this stuff. So for those of you who don't, don't know me, uh, my name is Graham Noseworthy. I am uh, the proud holder of a CT-16. I was a camper in the 80s. I am the parent of two current campers. Uh, I am also a one-week program cabin dad. Uh, my wife, Carrie, and I uh, fundraised for Project 141, and I'm also a volunteer vice president of the board of directors for the Dakota Y. Um, I'm a volunteer historian because uh, several years ago, I sort of got really into reading the records and I've read just about everything we have going all the way back to December the 8th, 1913, our first meeting. And I've authored uh, quite a few articles, um, but it doesn't mean I have everything right. Now, the information sources, the way I've gathered all of this stuff, um, and thank goodness people like Uncle Oscar and Aunt Francis were uh, extensive record keepers is we have two primary sources, the Lake Street Archives and the Alumni Center Library uh, that is currently at camp. And we have a lot of original documents going back. We have a lot of board meeting books. Um, we have the we have the um, the history compilations. I actually have one here on my desk um, that were actually authored by Oscar himself in 1971. Um, and then there's just lots of records and, and interviews and all kinds of stuff that come together. But just remember, I'm not always right. I try to triple confirm everything. But if you know something is different, or if you have something you want to um, add to the to the records, please at any time let me know. So tonight I'm going to primarily just share some PowerPoint slides and some of the other Dakota history um, talks that I do. I also share maps and satellite photographs, original documents, photos. There will be a new discovery that I share tonight that's kind of cool. Um, but not everything in our archives was labeled, unfortunately. So some of the photos may be a little out of order, but um, we're going to do this. So without any further ado, let's get started. Here's what we're going to cover tonight about the Elwells. I want to dispel some myths versus reality right out of the gate. We're going to do a little bit of a biography. So what did these two do before they came to Dakota, uh, to Dakota? I want to talk about them taking the helm in 21. We're going to go all the way through to their retirement. Um, and then um, if anybody has any memories or short stories uh, that they want to share, that's great. Or if you have any questions, that's great too. And then I'll share something a little extra. All right. I want to start off with this. Um, this is something that I found in the records. Um, this was typed by Oscar himself and presented to Fuller Ripley, the president of the Cheshire County YMCA on September the 1st, 1971. So this document represents one of the last official acts Oscar ever took um, as a member of the Tocodian family, a formal member of the Tocodian family. And I really like this for a couple of reasons. First of all, you, you all may remember there's a sundial at camp right in front of Hobby Nook, right? We all know the sundial with the arrow in it. That is, was dedicated for the Elwells themselves. If you look on the side, there's a plaque that says that. And I like this quote. I mark only the bright hours. And so in life, let us forget the dark days and remember only the bright ones. And then look at all those exclamation points he put. Let us forget evil others have done to us and remember only the many deeds of kindness. Hard right against the easy wrong, right? I just thought that that was really pretty and a nice way to start. Okay, let's just get some myths and realities out of the, out of the way. First of all, it's important you know that everything the Elwells did was for the mission. It was never for the money, right? I mean, it, they literally spent their entire lives, 50 years of their lives, dedicated to our mission, right? So really focused on youth development, healthy living, uh, social responsibility. I mean, those, those terms are a little bit more modern, but it was essentially the same thing back then. However, 
nobody's perfect. And it's important to remember that even the revered among us. I mean, I was a camper in the 80s and Oscar and Francis were these almost mythical godlike figures, but they're not perfect either. And that's okay. But there was kind of a reality to the Elwells, which is you either loved Oscar and Francis <laughs> or you didn't. There was really no middle ground. But from what I have learned over time, a vast majority of people truly loved the Elwells. Now, Dakota was their life. In some ways, it was the first and only career they ever had. And I'll explain why I know that in a few minutes. And to be honest with you, somebody like me, I've had many different jobs in my life. It's actually profound to think that they went and did one thing, put their entire lives into it, and, and that's what they did. And I think in many ways, that's why we still uh, hold them with such regard today. Now, Oscar, Oscar was a hard-charging authoritarian leader. Okay, so what that means is he was the boss. It was his way or the highway. Now, those are actually his words. Um, you either did the things the way he wanted you to, he wanted them done, or you didn't do it at all. But he also did not delegate. He was involved in everything. Meaning Oscar didn't just rely on the staff to get the job done while he was off kind of just focusing on fundraising or whatever it may be. He was involved in everything. Now, that's a good thing for people like me who are historians because he recorded everything. I mean, I can literally tell you in these documents, and this one I'm holding in my hand is nothing compared to what's out there. Literally every single thing, every building, every nail, every program decision was documented, and it's incredible to read. More importantly, in fact, to me, most importantly, because I'm a huge believer in diversity, Francis pushed hard for balanced programming for girls from the get-go, and I cannot tell you how unusual that was in the early 1920s. It was almost unheard of. It was either Girl Scouts or nothing. And in fact, we'll get to it in a little while, that that was part of the agreement for them to go. Now, while they were devout Christians, they did truly believe in, in our motto, friendly to all, and they were welcoming to everyone. And Uncle Oscar, the uncle, or many people just called him uncle. In fact, I still hear some of our old timers just call him uncle. Um, and Aunt Francis, where there were prefixed titles that they wore with great pride. It's not very common nowadays. It was a little more common back then. Um, but they were terms, informal sort of terms of endearment and were really, really important to them. Now, what did they do before they came to Camp Dakota. Well, Oscar's career began at the Bennington, Vermont YMCA, where he was a night desk clerk. He was paid 20 cents per hour. <laughs> and he did that while he attended high school. Now, he, in many uh, times, would be found sleeping under the front desk um, because he was also working very late night shifts with his father. Here's the important part. The important part is that Oscar was fundamentally and always a very, very hardworking individual. I don't know how much the man rested. From what I've seen in the records, it doesn't seem like very much. Took a vacation once in a while, that was about it. Um, at the age, in 1915, at the age of 18, Oscar was the first scoutmaster for the Boy Scouts of America in Bennington, Vermont. Um, and his experience in scouting really provided that solid foundation for Oscar's youth and work career, camping, leadership at Camp Dakota. In 1916, he became the Bennington Wise Youth Director. Now, for a man of his age, that was actually quite a big deal. Uh, but he wanted to attend college and become a doctor. And that's pretty interesting. I want you to think for a minute if things had been a little different and history hadn't provided us with the Elwells, how different our camp may be today. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But the lack of family resources really made that an impossible uh, reality for Oscar. Um, and so he found himself working day shifts alongside his father in the factory and his brother uh, to support the family. Uh, and Oscar never finished high school which is actually something I did not know until recently. On September the 14th, 1916, Oscar married his high school sweetheart, Eula Francis. Now, here's what's inter interesting about this. I always thought Francis was her first name. <laughs> I didn't know it wasn't. Francis is her middle name, um, and I was not aware of that. So they left 
uh, to go to Springfield College. Now, Oscar pursued a Bachelor of Humanics degree at Springfield. I don't, that degree doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but while he was there from six, 1916 to 1921, um, and Oscar taught swimming lessons and he sold shoes at Haynes Clothiers. And I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second because I've got something, a uh, one recent discovery to show you. And let me share my second screen. Actually, I'm gonna share this photo. Is that photo sharing? Great, thank you. Now, this is a picture of Springfield, Massachusetts um, in 1917 or 18, I believe. If you look here on the corner of this image, you can see on the left-hand side, that is Haynes Clothiers. That is the store, the very entrance in that window where Oscar sold shoes. That is where Oscar worked. You can actually see it there and you can see the wonderful clothing and all the hats and all these things here. Let me tell you something. I grew up not far from, uh, uh, I grew up in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is not far from Springfield. And <laughs> it does not look like this anymore. I have no idea what this crazy looking building is here, but that is where Oscar worked. I'll go back to my deck. Okay, so we're talking all about Oscar, right? What was Francis doing during this time? Well, um, Francis managed the college pool rental, okay? She was a Girl Scout captain leading Girl Scout troops in Springfield. That's a big deal. And she was also uh, part of the aquatics direction team at Springfield, which if you know Springfield College, Spring that's a very big deal um, for a woman of her age at that time. And this experience was Francis's foundation for developing Dakota's first girls camp program. And again, we're talking about the early 20s when that happened, that's a big deal. Now these pictures on the screen in front of you are somewhat cool. Um, down in the lower right corner, that's the Bennington Vermont YMCA. That is where, that's the building uh, where uh, Oscar worked. Directly above that, this image here is a football pep party um, that with reasonable certainty, I can tell you Oscar and Francis are somewhere in that image. Uh, that was at Springfield College. This image in the middle is a typical dorm room um, that Oscar would have lived in. This is the uh, Boy Scouts uh, in Bennington where uh, he did some work. This is a Springfield College building here. Um, and then over here is the picture of Springfield that I showed you. Now, let's talk a little bit about Dakota before the Elwells, because for those of us, especially uh, for some of you who are younger, who are really familiar with camp now, let me tell you, camp looked absolutely nothing in any way, shape, or form, with very few exceptions, uh, back then as it does now. What I can tell you is that this building on the right, that's the office. That is the office we all know with the office porch. You'll see there's no Bodo or back of the office here that was built many years later. But these columns, this roof, those doors, this is the same ones that are there. That's one of the only buildings that were there when we first occupied the site in 1916. This is the original waterfront. This is Camp Street, the original tents that were there. So as you can see, um, calling it rustic would be a substantially large uh, understatement. It was a pretty uh, primitive place. Um, that was there, that was it, that was the waterfront. Now this picture here in the middle with these people playing tennis or something, this is a new discovery. I have to spend some time studying this image because I cannot tell where it was taken. Um, I almost debated whether or not it was camp, but it's labeled camp and I'm pretty sure it is, but there's a building off to the left here and I can't tell what it is. So I'm gonna have to do some digging. Anyway, my point is there wasn't much there. We're gonna take another step back. I just wanna remind you before we get to the Elwells, the Elwells were not our first directors. Um, and it is important to note that they are, I use the term directors and I'll explain that in a minute. Howard T. Ball was our first director. He helped organize our YMCA and he created Camp Primitive on Swansea Lake. That's the precursor to Dakota. And he was there from 13 to 15. 
Daniel Lawrence was with us from 15 to 1920. He created the first several years of Camp Dakota. In fact, he created Camp Dakota, named it with a gentleman named Elgin Jones. Our first camp was on Tolman Pond in uh, Nelson, New Hampshire, and then we transitioned to the Richmond site. Victor Smith was only with us for a year. He was our third secretary. He was with us from 1920 to 1921, and he was primarily focused on just recruiting a new permanent director. So he was sort of an interim director. And now we've arrived at the Elwells. Oscar Elwell, he is the fourth secretary of the Cheshire County YMCA, but Oscar and Francis were co-directors of YMCA Camp Dakota. Pictured in the middle is their uh, daughter. She was adopted. Um, it is important to note that, and I will clarify that a, a little later, but that is their daughter, Verna. And I love this photo because Oscar and Francis are holding the bows and arrows correctly, and Verna is just totally paying attention to the photographer. <laughs> and you can see she's right in the middle of it. Okay. Now, in the early 20s, the Elwells take the helm. When they get there, they find a, uh, a YMCA that is financially viable, but struggling with fundraising and struggling with maintaining um, solid uh, finances. They find a property that has almost nothing, very few buildings, very few tents, absolutely no utilities whatsoever, no running water, no heat, obviously no electricity, no vehicles, no roads, no fields, no formal waterfront, absolutely almost everything you know about Camp Dakota did not exist. Now in the upper, whoop. There we go. In the upper left corner here, you can actually see what Hobby Nook used to look like. That is Hobby Nook um, before it became um, anything of, of substance that we know now. The photo below it, you can actually see Oscar right here. And I can share this deck later if people want to um, zoom in on some of these photos. But you can see Oscar here. He's actually standing next to Elgin Jones, the man that named Camp Dakota. This is a very early group of girls because you can see the tents in the background. These are our first cabins ever, the first cabins ever being built. Um, there's a, another little shot of Hobby Nook kind of sitting off on its own. We have a lot of pictures of it because it was one of the only buildings we had. And then this is Camp Street. This is where the original cabins were. For those of you that don't know where Camp Street was, if you stand on the office and you look straight down the road that goes towards the waterfront before you get to overlook on either side of the road, one, two, three on each side, that's where the original cabins were. That was Camp Street. Now, the Elwells get there. Graham, really they, quickly. Uh, shoot. Question. Um, uh, did the girls have uniforms? It looks like they're all wearing the same thing in that photo. Boy, that's a great question. So uniforms were actually a strict and very rigid part of Camp Dakota for many, many, many decades. So they absolutely did have um, uniforms. And part of the thing to remember is that the Elwells, um, because they were both so experienced at scouting, they brought a lot of scouting traditions with them to camp. So uniforms, merit badges, we would actually now call them CTs. I actually have all of my CTs hanging right here. So there's a lot of traditions that we have at, at, at Camp Dakota that are actually rooted um, in scouting, and both boy and girl scouts. And yes, they had uniforms. Later, they only wore the uniforms on Sundays, from what I've been able to recollect. They had like, um, you got dressed up in your best Dakota blues and went to uh, dinner, um, but they did have uniforms. And you'll see some more photos of that later. Now, once the LOL settled in, camp started to rapidly and dramatically take, take shape. Um, I mean, we expanded from almost nothing to a sprawling campus, but it was very basic. Again, remember there were no utilities. Um, at that time, Cass Pond was called Echo Lake or uh, later, um, it was also called Wheeler Pond in some records, but um, quite honestly, uh, Oscar just referred to it as Dakota Lake. So gender diversity 
and some of the familiar traditions that we know now started to take hold almost from the get-go when the when the LOLs got there. So things like candlelight, CTs, um, tenure jackets came a little later, but uh, the, the green cabins, um, a lot the songs, the uh, opening campfire, closing campfire, a lot of the things that we still do today all started with the Elwells a long time ago. The Elwells were also big believers in international staff. Um, and they brought, looks like I got a typo there, but that's all right. Um, they brought international staff and actually Native American staff from around the region and around the nation um, and international staff from overseas. They brought people all over um, to camp to work. And they traveled around taking the best of the best. They went to different camps. They went to different Y camps, scouting camps, Christian camps. Um, they went to all kinds of things. They even went to a few prison camps, believe it or not. And they took the best of the best traditions, songs, um, programming. They learned lessons. They looked at facilities and buildings. They figured out schedules, the bell. All of these things were all adopted from other places. Now they were friendly to all, but we had very, very strict Christian uh, values for quite a long time. And that may seem a little strange to some of us, even me in the 80s. I mean, there was none of that. Um, but it was pretty strict back then. Nevertheless, they were friendly to all. So the 20s were just a time of, in the 30s, quite honestly, were a time of huge growth and change. Properties, programs, people, fundraising, I'll touch upon that in a minute, facilities. But here's the thing to remember. Camp Dakota is really a tale of two properties. There's what camp looked like before the hurricane of 1938, and there's what camp looked like ever since after the hurricane of 1938. And camp now and camp in 1939 looked radically different from anything that came before it, and we'll touch upon that as well. But as they built, they had a theme, and I have seen this theme echoed in the records all over the place almost every year in reports, in minutes, in presentations, in celebrations. Everything was always bigger and better. Oscar and Francis were on a relentless pursuit to make camp bigger and better. And they would hold court. They were the they were the royalties. They were the king and queen. They were they were it, the buck stopped entirely with Francis and Oscar. Now, this picture on the left, I love this photo for a few reasons. First of all, I think it's hilarious that Oscar is smiling and Francis is sitting there looking like she's, she's not too happy. But what's a be what the beautiful thing about this photo is, this is TPAC. This is the old dining hall. Now, I think this is in the late 20s. And here's what's really cool. If you look in the back, you'll see there's a sign over the door. This is Camp Dakota. We still have that sign in, in the archives. But here's what's even better. Does it look a little funny? It should look a little funny to you because the shape isn't right. The reason for that is this is the original front of the building. That is no longer there. An extension was put onto that building in the 1930s. And if you go into TPAC today, or which was my dining hall, this was my dining hall when I was a kid. If you go into this dining hall or TPAC today and you walk in, you will notice there are clearly two different color floors. There's the old floor, which is dark, and there's the new floor put on in the extension, which is light. And you can clearly see where the old um, the, the, where this line was that this building um, originally stopped. And this one on the right, this is Oscar sitting in reading a story, it looks like, to girls um, in Friendship Lodge. That's friendship. Ryan, did we have a question come in? No, people were just commenting that um, there, there are several people in this group who attended uh, when TPAC was the dining hall. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm one of them. I loved it. I loved it. I've got so many wonderful memories and stories. And I'm just so glad that we still have that building. And I actually learned something interesting about that building not too long ago. Um, and I'll quickly share that with you. If you look at the side of TPAC now, where the camp store is currently located, that is a 25 foot section of the building that was originally 
on the back of Hobby Nook when Hobby Nook was actually a kitchen in a dining hall. And later they moved that to create an ice house. That's why it's lower. That's why it's a little bit below ground because it kept the ice cold. Um, so that whole section where the camp store is was originally part of Hobby Nook. Now, Boost to Coda, right? We've all heard the term. We've all seen the sign. Some of us grew up with different signs over the years. But if, 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 I, could, if I could absorb one power from Uncle Oscar, it would be his power of fundraising. It, it is uncanny. I have never heard of anything like it. The man definitely could have been a hard-charging politician. I, I, I honestly don't know why he didn't. Um, but he was a miraculous fundraiser. And here's one of the reasons Oscar was so good at it. Oscar didn't ask you for money. Oscar told you you were going to give money. <laughs> and he did it with people of all ages. He did it with captains of industry. And he did it with locals. And, and if he needed a vehicle, in fact, you're looking at one, he would just tell you... Um, Sounds like we got an alarm or something going off in my house. Oh, never mind. Somebody blow out a candle. We're good. Okay, I literally thought my house was on fire. So we'll 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 whew, take a deep breath and we'll get back into this. Um, but it, it didn't matter what it was, whether Oscar needed a. a, a huge donation to buy land or whatever it was. He didn't ask you. He just told you. And promotion and fundraising was a year round effort and all Tocodians were expected to participate, even kids, staff, anybody. And he did this in a variety of ways. So whether it was reunions, registration days, pep parties, annual meetings, community associations, mailing ads, news, films, stories, radio interviews. It goes on and on and on. The man at year round was working to raise money for Camp Dakota. It was astounding. And it wasn't just actual donations of money he was getting. It was land, assets. So whether it was like a stove or a fridge or anything like that, uh, equipment, buildings, everything came from people young and old. I mean, I've seen stories of kids sending in a dollar here, 10 cents there. I've seen, um, you know, we had a, a longtime benefactor. You'll recognize her name. Her name was Kate Davis. Davis Field was donated uh, in land that she purchased after her husband passed away. I mean, Kate not only cut checks for whatever, whatever, Oscar and Francis wanted or needed, but she also did things herself like the wiring that is currently in the office building was hand installed by Kate Davis herself. Um, and that's pretty crazy. The other ways that he would do this, and this is important because this porch still exists. If you are at the entrance to Camp Dakota and you look, or you're facing 119 and you look off to the left, you'll see there's a white house with a red barn. That is a property that we recently purchased with 10 acres. That is the Dickinson household. And there was a gentleman there named Harold Dickinson. He was a long time caretaker of our camp's property. And Harold and Oscar were thick as thieves and they had what's called scheming Sundays. They would sit on the porch and they would scheme. They would come up with new ways to raise money, get land um, and get donations or whatever they wanted. And they did that every single Sunday for years and years and years. But it wasn't just about the fundraising, right? It was about the mission and tradition and patriotism was at the very heart of Uncle Oscar's Dakota and, and Aunt Francis too. I mean, I really, whenever I say one, I should say the other because it was a, it, it was a partnership through and through. This is a beautiful photograph of the, where, one of the original locations of the flagpole. This is directly outside um, uh, the dining hall. Again, this is the dining hall before it had its addition put on. So the hardware or the original cement foundation of this, um, flagpole would probably be right under where the steps into the dining hall are now. This is pre-hurricane and I believe off to the left here, I believe that is the man himself, that is Oscar standing there. Um, but you can see 
uh, you, again, you recognize the traditions, right? There's a team folding the flag, everybody standing at attention. That is how we do things at camp because that is how they did them then. Now, it's important to note that, again, that camp was a place of constant development and change. I found these photos today. I wanted to share them with you. Um, this up in the upper right corner, shortly after it was built, this is the, uh, uh, the brown athletic fields. Nowadays, we would call it a field. Uh, I think this photo is actually post hurricane based on the uneven trees, but I'm not 100% sure. So I just tossed it in here. This is the dining hall uh, about two days after the, it was completed. Um, you can really get a sense of how different the dining hall looked. This is Friendship Lodge in the winter. This is when the flagpole was relocated to its present position. This is formerly known as Cabin 1, but I believe it is now known as Cabin 3, um, sitting in the corner right near the entrance to where you would walk to the point. But this picture in the middle is interesting. Can anybody tell me what they notice is missing from this photograph? Take a good look. I'll give you a hint. It would be around over here and it would be somewhat hard to see, but if you know to look for it, you'd know. Ryan, I am not looking at that chat if someone's answering. No, someone, well, okay. So uh, yes, uh, we're, uh, the guesses are Public Beach and D Field. So both of those are correct. The public beach is not there. The houses are there. You can actually see them. And the, the D field beach is also not there. Great, great eyes. Whoever guessed that, you're ready to be a historian. It, it right. sounds like it was one of our uh, current staff members, Potomac, uh, who, who weighed in with that. Um, there you go, buddy. I, I, know, I know exactly who Potomac is. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone else asked what Friendship Hall was originally used for. Oh, great question. So um, it was originally used for its current use. It was staff housing. Um, for a long time, it was staff housing, but the, the main room there was also used um, for gatherings and, you know, inclement weather when they needed to. So almost exactly the same way we use it today with one slight change which is back then winter reunions, winter pep parties, all sorts of things that Oscar did year round to keep the interest up about camp. Um, that was where they held those parties and they had those winter reunions in there. And we've got lots of photos of Santa Claus. He'll make an appearance later in this talk. Um, we've got lots of pictures and stuff like that of some of those things going on because that was one of the very few buildings we had very, very early that was actually somewhat winterized. It wasn't really too well, but it was somewhat designed to do that. So that's a good question. Okay. We have arrived at 1938. Okay. And what you are looking at are four pictures in the immediate aftermath of the great New England hurricane. It was also known as the Long Island Express. And the reason it was called the Long Island is Express is because first of all, it came ashore on Long Island. And second of all, it sounded like a freight train and it absolutely positively smashed its way um, through the New England states. And to be perfectly honest with you, there is no other way to put it. It destroyed Camp Dakota. It was um, very, very painful for them to find it, their beloved camp and the condition it was in. Um, I've spent extensive time reading the accounts and looking at the photos and it's the subject of my next Dakota history talk and we'll dive into it deeper, but it's important to note. Um, and I want to call your attention to just a couple of things here. Actually, you can't really see it, but this is Oscar holding a saw here, but you see this picture of Oscar. Take a good look at the man. The man is sitting in the middle of his destroyed beloved camp that he has sunk many years into at this point. He is dejected. He is upset. He is wearing a full suit, which is, pretty remarkable. And at no point did Oscar say, and I assure you he could have, but at no point did he say, that's it, we're done. I, I, I don't know what to do that we're just, it's over. He actually said, we're going to be bigger and better. 
it's going to give us more room for play. It's going to give us more room for sunshine. We're going to sell these logs. We're going to do some remarkable stuff. And I'll dig into the, the, the real nitty gritty of this in my next talk. But by the way, you may have heard me a little earlier mention Aunt Kate Davis. And again, remember, aunt and uncle were a term of endearment in those days. I believe this is Kate Davis standing right here. She is holding an ax and she is standing outside the original twin building. There were twins. There were two of them. That's why we still use the name to this day. They were the original bathhouse. This building was picked up, smashed to pieces, and put back down by a micro tornado in the middle of the, uh, of the storm. And we've got pictures of it sitting there, and I'll go into that. So, 1938. Camp is destroyed. In that moment, Oscar makes the decision to do a full, complete reconstruction of camp and start clearing out the fields that had been destroyed. That is why we have the clearing at the top where Hobby Nook and Grooby and Hemlocks, that, uh, that's why that's there because that was a group of trees that were ripped out and destroyed by the hurricane. That is why we have B field. That is why A, a field is bigger than it is. That is why lots of things are different in our camp because the hurricane changed it. But as you can imagine, shortly after the hurricane, we also have to face another reality. Now camp is operating in the middle of World War II. And along with that means that Tokodians are dying in World War II. And there are 12 of them. So in 1945, as part of that Scheming Sunday program, Oscar... Dick Dickinson, the board of directors, a whole bunch of people decide that they're going to build a building to honor the 44 Tacodians who had died um, from the years 1916 to 1945. And they decided to dedicate the lodge to 12 of them. And those are the 12 lost Tacodians that died, or as we put it, made the supreme sacrifice in the Second World War. And I'll do a Dakota history talk on that as well. We've extensively researched them. But Oscar always envisioned Memorial Lodge being a crown jewel of Camp Dakota. And I think we could all agree that that goal was achieved. There is not a Tacodian among us who does not, who, who is not capable of closing our eyes and putting ourselves in a wicker armchair and sitting on that porch and feeling the sun or the rain or the wind or whatever it is you want to feel and imagining the majesty and magic of that particular building, which by the way, has changed over time. If you look at the photo at the bottom, you'll see, it's kind of hard to see, but that's, that's Mem Lodge there. That's the, the waterfront. You can see the uneven trees because they're still recovering from the hurricane. This tree up here is only has leaves on one side because half of it was blown off. But you'll see there's no uh, cement foundation like we have now. The cement foundation of Memorial Lodge was actually built many, many, many years later. And what's funny is when they did that, they didn't jack the building up correctly and Memorial Lodge almost tumbled into the lake, but they were able to save it and we still have our beloved building today. Now, when it came to staff, Oscar and Francis wanted and they got the best of the best. They worked very, very, very hard to bring in the best staff. Um, and that went on for decades and decades and decades. I mean, they worked throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s um, to always make sure they had the best of the best staff. So whether it was aquatic or sports or crafts or administrative or medical or whatever it was. And you can see Rosie Smith here, who was a native Cherokee Indian, they uh, Native American, excuse me. They always brought in the best and brightest. And we have always, always uh, really prided ourselves at Camp Dakota on having exemplary staff members. So for those of you who either are or were staff, um, you are following in the footsteps of greatness. And these people came from all over. Um, so let's talk about what it was like to work for Uncle Oscar. And I love this picture of Uncle Oscar because he's in his Oscar uniform, right? He's got his white shirt on with his sleeves rolled up. He's got his pens and I'm sure some pad of paper in there. He's taking notes. His tie's a little loose. He looks a little grumpy. Um, and what was it really like to work for him? Well, from what I have been told, and I've interviewed a lot of Tacodians, is that loyalty, self-sacrifice, and hard work were the fundamentals he expected from absolutely everyone, including himself. 
Okay, that's the important thing to, to remember here. He wasn't sitting in a chair somewhere, you know, um, just laughing while everybody went and did the hard work. The man never stopped working. He expected you to lead by example, and you did not deviate from how Oscar ran the operation. Again, my way or the highway, that's Uncle Oscar. Everything he did, and I mean everything, trust me, I've seen it, is, was carefully tracked, documented, and accounted for. Um, the finances were perfectly tracked down to the cent. We used to have books upon books upon books of this stuff. Everything was documented. And if you worked hard, um, if you worked hard, you were invited back time and time again, because you were in. Once you were part of the Tocodian family, you were in if you worked hard. I mean, that's why we still have people who have 10, 20, 30 year jackets, because once you are part of the family and you work hard, that's it. That's how that you choose the hard right over the easy wrong. You're part of that family. Here's where it gets a little interesting. So <laughs> he had some written contracts. And one of the things you had to agree to was no smoking and no drinking. So whether you were on the property or off the property, you had to sign this document. You had to adhere to this document. If you I'll give you one quick story that I learned recently from a Tocodian uh, that I interviewed, and I just love this story. Three guys, right? Three staff members from a university, uh, a college, excuse me, down in Georgia had come to work uh, for camp that summer. Oscar often took staff from that particular school. I don't know why. Um, and these three guys thought that they would be pretty clever. So they left camp for the day and they went down to Winchester. And they bought some beer and they figured we went all the way to Winchester. The old man's never going to know. So they started drinking the beer and they made their way back. They stopped a few times and took a swim. God knows what finally made their way back to camp. Yeah. That doesn't work in Oscar's world. Oscar knew everybody. So the owner of this store called Oscar and said, Hey, look, I, I got these three guys. They looked like Tacodians. They sounded like Tacodians. They just bought beer, and I think they're heading back to camp. And Oscar says, oh, really? I know exactly who they are. So by the time these guys get back to camp, Oscar has blocked the road with three trunks. He has packed up their stuff. It's waiting in their trunks. There's a letter of, a letter of resignation. I'll explain that in the middle, in, in, in a moment. There's a letter of resignation sitting on top of the trunks with three checks that have been calculated to midnight the night before. And he's standing there probably looking exactly like this in this photo. Sleeves rolled up and the three guys roll up and they say, uncle, what, what, what's going on? What, what, what's, what's going on, uncle? And he says, well, <clears throat> I understand you've decided to leave us. Not you're fired. I understand you have made the choice to leave us. You violated your contract. You are out. And one guy immediately took his stuff and left. One guy was allowed to go get his car. The other guy said, my st I still have some stuff in the cabin. Oscar said, no problem. We'll mail it to you. He says, I don't have a ride. He says, no problem. Ask the other two to take you to a bus station or a train station. Goodbye. That was it. You were not fired. You decided to leave. That's what it was like to work for Uncle Oscar. Now, it's important to note, again, through the 50s and 60s, we are talking 20 solid years of expansion and development. Now, expansion and development does not come without constant effort, really being immersed in your Tocodian family. You know, these two didn't just build buildings and run the books. These two worked with the kids. They were embedded with the campers. They were part of the Tocodian family. They were huge members of the, of the, of the community. Um, for example, Oscar, uh, I had a list here. He was a 50-year Rotarian. He was a Paul Harris Fellow, Elliott Community Hospital Board, Springfield College alum with Tar Bell Medallion, United Church of Christ Keene. He was a, 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 a past master in the Masons in, um, in Keene, which I'm a, a, a Freemason, I can assure you that's a big deal. He was a 35-year treasurer of the Northeast Camping. He was a two-term treasurer of the American Camping Association. We're talking, this is a man that leveraged every every single resource he could possibly leverage to build our camp. Um, so when you walk our grounds, you are walking the grounds that, that Oscar and Francis built, but they did it together and they did it with the Tocodians. It was 
for us, by us, with us. I just love these pictures. I, there's so many of them. Um, I, I mean, I've just found hundreds of them. They all tickle me. They're, they're all smiles. This is them um, with their staff and all of these pictures. You can see Oscar and Francis there, there. Uh, in one of these, they've got the dog. There they are, there, there they are, there when they're much younger. Um, you know, here they are standing next to the totem that used to be out front of uh, Friendship Lodge. And, and then you can see them in uh, little later years on either side of these photos. But in most of the photos I see, everybody is smiling, right? And it's not just because the photographer said cheese. It's because we all know what it's like to be there. We all know what it's like to feel that. And we all know what it's like to be a happy Tacodian. I told you Santa was going to make a, a, pre, a visit, but unfortunately, Santa's visit is, is, is only because I didn't, uh, because of the COVID-19 situation we're living under, I didn't have time to do a lot more uh, going into the books that I would normally do. And this is the only photo I could find of what I believe is Oscar's famous Buick. I don't know if that's Oscar, but I know I'm almost positive that is his Buick. And here's why the Buick is important. It's important for two reasons. First of all, we had a lot of vehicles at camp over the year. A lot of them hung on for a long time. But the Buick was special because um, a, a, another Tacodian told me a story this week about how if Oscar wanted his car cleaned, he would just drive it into camp. He would park it near the spigot, uh, near the water that's down near, you know, the one that has the hose hanging on it near the big chair. He would just park it near there. And people who wanted to curry favor with Oscar would come out and clean the car. And then they'd come up into the office and they'd say, oh, hey, uncle, I, uh, <clears throat> I took care of uh, cleaning your car for you. And Oscar's Buick was his chariot. Uh, however, what I can tell you is uh, the chariot there has a bit of a different story that isn't the greatest. So it's important to note this. On the 29th of September, 1968, so we've jumped forward a bit here, um, Oscar and Francis were involved in a very, very, very severe car accident. In fact, the two of them were lucky to survive. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know what happened. All I know is it was near Concord in New Hampshire. Oscar was hospitalized for four months. Now, think about this. We're talking about a man who is involved in all day, every day, almost to a level of obsession over his job, his career, um, his Tacodian family, and this substantially large operation. And he is just out of it for four months. Um, so uh, Francis stepped in with help of the board and took over the control of the operation as best she could. What's interesting is that the Buick was destroyed. What I learned recently that I never knew is that we have two garages that are out behind where like the staff housing is. Um, I think now we call them the bunker. I'm not sure. Uh, the bunker. And the Buick was actually parked in the bunker for a long, long time because Oscar was embroiled in an insurance battle trying to get the insurance company to pay. And to this day, I wonder if there might be pieces of the Buick in there somewhere. It was only later that in the night in the year, very early 1970s, the board finally said, you got to get that Buick out of there. And that's what took us to eventually um, the retirement. Now, what's really interesting is shortly after he recovered from the accident, um, on one of our anniversaries, I think it was, actually, it may have even been before the accident, but on one of our anniversaries, they, uh, the Elwells decided to retire. So late 60s, we're talking. And they had a huge party for them. These people were masters of celebrating each other constantly. The board, the Elwells, uh, the whole community, leaders of the community, they would just, they were constantly honoring each other with awards and ceremonies. And there's good reason for that. It wasn't ego, it was marketing. It was, they were in the news, there were photos. It was, everybody was aware of what was happening at this incredible YMCA and this amazing camp. And, they decided to retire. So they have this party, they have a retirement party for them. And Oscar, who is famous for being a bit of a windbag and getting up and speaking and speaking and speaking, it's his turn at his retirement party for him to get up and give this amazing eloquent retirement speech. Well, Oscar gets up and he says, <clears throat> 
Well, thank you for uh, this retirement party. Uh, Francis and I just had a conversation and we've decided not to retire. We're going to work for another 50 years. Thank you. And he goes and sits down. And the board of directors is looking around like, uh, what? What do we do now? So they just put the man back to work and he went back to work. So for the next few years, Oscar went back to work. However, he's getting a little old, he's getting a little forgetful, and his authoritarian style of working is starting to age out. So in Oscar's final years, and I am, uh, final years as an employee, by the way, I didn't mean final years towards anything else, but his final years as an employee with the Cheshire County YMCA, we paid him to be a consultant. And his job, and I am so thankful they had him do this, was to thoroughly document our entire history from 1913 uh, through 1971. And he documented the whole thing, obviously with a focus on the 50 years that he and Francis uh, were um, in control um, and uh, running the Cheshire County YMCA and YMCA Camp Dakota. And the documents are absolutely incredible to read. And what's really interesting is there's uh, several different copies that he worked on at several different times. And I think the reason for that is he was doing somewhat like what I do, which is to check everything in triplicate. So uh, you basically, try to tell the story three times, make sure it matches and check it with all your sources. Um, and that's exactly what he did. In the middle, you can see them pictured shortly before their retirement. This is probably one of my most favorite photographs we have. It's iconic, it's beautiful, it's the two of them in the ways in which we really truly remember them, at least for you know, people like me who didn't necessarily know them, like some of the people on the phone on, on this call did, um, but they're also wearing their 10 year jackets. It's important to know that the jacket Oscar is wearing, we have it. Um, it is currently in our possession, in our archives, and I believe it is brought out for CT ceremonies. On the left and the right, you can see Oscar um, speaking during the uh, dedication to um, the Elwell Chapel. And if you would like to learn more about the chapel, um, including listening to Oscar uh, give that speech. You can, there's a, uh, there's a web, web page that links to it. Um, you can listen to his speech and you can learn more about the chapel, including one of the things that we learned this year that I never knew was all of the stones that you see on the chapel, uh, on, the, on the altar that's in our chapel, those stones were sent in from individual Tacodians, and they represent individual memories and families from all over across our Tacodian, um, the decades prior, leading up to them retiring. So those are not just some stones or a veneer or something that was put on during construction. Those are actual stones sent in by actual Tacodians. Now, the Elwell's impact on today's Dakota, I, I cannot begin to describe to you how deep-seated this is. Um, almost everything that we have and continue to do in one way or another goes back to the work that they did. The, the people, meaning the type of staff, um, whether it's office staff, year-round staff, um, admin team, summer staff, internationals, to this day, we get the best of the best because that's what we expect, that's what we drive, that's what we have. And I see it myself time and time again, and it's wonderful. Our programs, so the things that we do, uh, and not just Camp Dakota, but also travel, um, also things like um, outdoor education, all have their roots in things the Elwells were doing. Certainly our property. I mean, we went from 60 acres to almost 600 in the course of just under 100 years. Um, that is a remarkable expansion. Um, and we'll talk about that next time uh, during the hurricane uh, briefing that I'll do. The buildings, a lot of the buildings we have were uh, constructed with uh, Elwell's efforts. And of course, our effect on our community, our traditions, things like CTs and more, the songs we sing, the ways in which we raise funds. Um, some of the funds that we actually have today, uh, literally investments were started by the Elwells. And, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so when you walk to Coda, you are walking with the Elwells. Um, this is another thing 
and I promise I'm almost done here, folks, but this is another thing um, that we found in the records that I, I just, I just, I loved this. So there's a little letter here. Um, these are orchid letters, they called them. I'm not 100% sure what that meant, but it really gave Oscar inspiration and great encouragement. Um, and these are people who are talking about, um, both of you have contributed so much to my life as a citizen, as a mother, as a teacher, you're giving of yourselves and developing an unbreakable camp spirit developed within me as a stronger desire to live by your rules, hard right, easy wrong, right? Just memorizing for the points, I can still see the huge sign entering the athletic field. For when there is one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he writes not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. And then I also love this thing at the bottom. May Dakota and the County Y continue to grow and prosper for another century. With more Dakotas, there would be less trouble in the world, greater love and understanding, and less rebellion. And look at he's got his exclamation points again. That's Oscar for you. So at this point, I've got a few very small other things I want to share, but Ryan, I thought we could open it up and just see if anybody wanted to share um, any little memories or short stories or things that they know about Uncle Oscar and Aunt Frances. And if you just want to take a minute or two to share something, please feel free to do that. Yeah, so I wanted to, um, Graham mentioned uh, a link where you can listen to the audio of the full chapel dedication. <clears throat> which actually features the voice of Uncle Oscar. It's really cool. Um, I dropped that link into the chat box, so you can copy that and listen to it at another time. On that SoundCloud page, there's so much other amazing audio as well to check out lots of stuff from uh, Buffalo Bob and others. Uh, so that's there. And uh, as Graham said, this is an invitation if you uh, have a story of the Elwell, something you've heard or something you uh, experienced, Please go ahead and unmute yourself um, and uh, just shout it out. No pressure. <laughs> and I guess I'll give you uh, just a second to, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> awesome question. Uh, two awesome questions. Uh, first one is, how is the chapel reconstruction coming along? Graham, do you want to take that or do you want me to? <laughs> Uh, well, I can tell you um, that the chapel has been what I would call beautifully but temporarily repaired. Um, it is definitely, it, I mean, it looks the better than it has in years and some of the watershed uh, around it has been improved. Um, but as you may or may not be aware, we have a master plan and the chapel is part of that master plan. So over time, um, we will eventually um, construct a more permanent and, and, and better suited to the uh, climate, sort of, you know, the way the water works at our property, a better chapel, um, but we will always retain um, the way it kind of looks and feels. So right now the chapel's in good shape and not only can you hear Uncle Oscar's dedication, but there's also an article that talks about the entire history, fundraising and construction of the chapel as well, which is pretty interesting. Well, I don't know, it's interesting to me. <laughs> Yeah, and, and here's a question. I don't, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but I think it's super fascinating. So thanks, Taylor, for asking. Um, how did Dakota uh, in general and um, maybe the Elwell specifically uh, respond to the civil rights era? Um, that is a very good question. Um, and the proof is in the pudding, right? So a couple of ways. First of all, remember you're talking about a couple who believed in um, never turning a child away for any reason. Um, even though they were devout and very strict Christians, you could be any religion and come to our camp. And gender diversity was a requirement. We know, Francis said to Oscar, I will not take this job. We will not go to New Hampshire unless we do this together and we do it for boys and girls. And that's what they did. So um, the two of them, I would like to think, and based on what I've seen in the records, I know that they embraced civil rights. Um, I know that they had some challenges around that, not because of their beliefs, but because of the region. We, you know, Southern New Hampshire at that time was not exactly the most diverse place on earth. Um, and so when you look at our photos, you, 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 you don't see a lot of 
um, diversity beyond gender. Um, I don't think that was by choice. I don't think that was deliberate. I, I mean, I've certainly never seen anything anywhere in the records, not even a hint, not even like a wait a minute, what did that mean kind of statement. I've never seen anything that made me think that they did not embrace civil rights. Great. Now, yeah, the last happy. thing I'll tell you actually because of civil rights is it's important to know that another discovery we made, we made recently was that a very important civil rights icon who's very famous in New Hampshire um, jo Jonathan Daniel, we discovered, was a Tacodian and went to our camp. Um, so uh, if you would like more information on that, I'd be happy to share that. We found his registration cards, a photo of him at camp, and a beautiful poem that was written by one of his leaders um, in really embracing civil rights. So I, I can assure you, considering a Tacodian actually died on behalf of the civil rights movement, it was, it was, a, it was, it was talked about. Great question. Yeah, if you got a question, go ahead and shout it out. Um, when did when did they die? Like, uh, yep, that's a that's a that's a great question. So, uh, Oscar died on February the eighth, nineteen eighty six, um, at the Cheshire Medical Center in Keene, New Hampshire, um, and I don't think I have. Let me check really, you know what? I don't think I have um, Aunt Frances's date of passing That's okay. handy here, but, it, but I'll tell you right now, it was right around the same time. That's a good question. And I've got something related to him there in the 80s that I'll show in just a couple of moments. Uh, Any other questions, any stories? Well, so Florence uh, shared that she recalls in 1965 when she was a leader in cabin 10, <laughs> uh, with the girls, uh, uh, I guess one night that they were maybe talking too long into the evening, and so Uncle Oscar stood right outside of the cabin to make sure that they were behaving properly. So that's that's kind of fun. I don't know if uh, Florence has audio and the ability to comment more on that, but I think that's Florence, I'm pretty sure I got a picture of you uh, in this blue folder right back here. By the way, yeah, um, that's wonderful. And, and, and Florence said, oh, and added on to that, uh, that just like in that other photo, the one that you sort of characterized him as a little bit grumpy looking uh, with his hands on his hips, that's exactly what, uh, what he was doing outside of their cabin. I don't doubt it. That's a great story, Florence. Um, and then Becca asked, uh, after their retirement, um, were they still involved with uh, Dakota in any way? Um, you know... <clears throat> Not as much as I think we would have, uh, we would have all liked or liked to believe. You know, part of the problem was at the end, um, he didn't want to go. Um, <laughs> to use his own words, he made his own decision to go, you know, if you follow me here, which means it got to the point where we finally had to say, I'm sorry, but you're done and you have to go. Um, and that didn't sit very well with him for quite a while. However, the Elwell Chapel fixed all of that. Um, and when we really t took it upon ourselves as a community to honor what they had accomplished um, and build something, a permanent memory to them, and later a cabin was built for them, um, and of course the, the uh, sundial, um, it turned all that around. And uh, I'll share a photo that's pretty important to me in just a couple of, couple of moments here. We'll take one more. Yeah, Aaron and uh, Reagan. Go ahead. Go ahead, girls. Um, so I was looking on Google to see your logo because I was doing some, I was like making a drawing or something. Um, and it said that you do weddings. Is that true? It is true. So if, so think about how beautiful Dakota is, right? Think about how beautiful Mem Lodge is. Think about how beautiful our new Centennial Terrace, so the, the big thing that sticks off the back of the dining hall now. Think of how lovely uh, TPAC is, right? Um, those are beautiful places to build a memory that lasts forever, whether you're a Tacodian or you're getting married. And Camp Dakota in the spring and Camp Dakota in the fall, when the colors have all changed, is beyond spectacular. One of the things that I love about our beloved camp is the fact that any season, 
Now, I don't live there. Ryan has to live there. But any season camp is extraordinarily beautiful. There's really only a few weeks where it's kind of a muddy, disgusting mess. But other than that, it's and a it's really beautiful right property. Now, exactly. It's like that right now. So uh, that so great question. And the answer is yes, we do weddings. We've done a lot of them. And if you if you do Camp Dakota wedding, if you Google that, you'll see some really beautiful photos. Yeah, I saw I saw really pretty ones. Uh, I've, I've seen them transform the dining hall into something that is like, beautiful like before and an after yeah it's it's gorgeous okay i'm going to share just a couple of more things if that's right. really quickly that um lori commented that she was in a in cabin 10 as well and she remembers the incident that florence was talking about or a very similar one <laughs> she thinks that maybe cabin 10 just had uh, a reputation uh, so, hey, let me tell you something. All so, of you in cabin ten, be careful. So I, I can relate to that. My cabin one in 1989. I still talk to my leaders. They still call it the Troublemakers Club or Cabin Hell or something like that. But we were. Uh, I was one of those cabins, so I can um, I can understand that. All right, let me share a couple of more things because we're running a little late. But I appreciate you you all hanging in here. We're learning new things all the time. Just this week, I learned about this. This is called a circuit camera. It is a panoramic camera, and it's the type known as full rotation. If you see, this camera is sitting on a tripod with like a turntable on it. It was patented by William L. Johnson in 1904 and was manufactured by the Rochester Panoramic Camera Company starting in 1905. This is the camera that was used to take the vintage Elwell era panoramic camp photos that you see hanging up in Memorial Lodge. So the next time you go in Mem Lodge and you see those long pictures, this is the, ca the camera that took them. Here's the part that blew me away. I never knew this. Tacodians were arranged in a semicircle. They are not sitting in a straight row because the camera had to turn to photograph them all. So even though the pictures look like they're sitting in a straight row, in many cases, they are not. And now that I look at the pictures and I studied a whole bunch of them this week, now I can tell because it actually looks like it's sloping downhill just a little bit. And the other thing I realized is that in order for a photo like this to work, everybody had to hold really, really still for, a while, for quite a little bit of, of time, you know, seconds, not minutes, but enough time that you had to hold still. So when you look at these photos, you can always find one or two kids that weren't very good at sitting still, and so they're blurry. So the next time you go to Mem Lodge, whether you go to the girl side or the boy side, go up to those pictures and look for some faces, and you'll find some faces that are blurry. And that's because those kids couldn't sit still long enough to get their picture taken and this is the camera that took those pictures now i said i was going to share a picture of oscar that is important to me this is oscar visiting camp in what i think is around 1983 the boy who has his chin resting on his hand is not me that is my older brother jay and this photo, we found it in our parents' house. I had never seen it until, I think it was about a year or two ago, we found it. My brother has no recollection of this, but that is my brother with Uncle Oscar. Um, I know what my brother looked like when I started camp. So I think I was probably there on that day. My brother and I were always in camp together. So I was probably there as a very, very, very young boy. Um, in fact, I'll show you a picture of what that looked like in just a second, but that is my brother with Uncle Oscar. So my point is that history awaits us in the most unlikely places. I never would have thought that I'd find an, a picture of an old Uncle Oscar visiting camp and you can see, look at that moment. That boy that my brother is looking at is telling Uncle Oscar some sort of story and Oscar is all in. He is totally transfixed in listening to this boy's story because once a Tacodian always a Tacodian. So I want to encourage you to share your history. Our camp is a place of extraordinary beauty and history, and it's an incredible community. And every Tacodian has a memory to share. So please, whether you tell each other, you tell a family member, or you just want to schedule time and tell me, I would love to hear your stories. So tell people about our beautiful camp. 
Oh, all right, there I am. That's what I looked like on my very first day at camp. And that's me standing in, on the same porch in front of the same door uh, just this past summer. I don't know why I had a black eye and missing teeth. I'm assuming it had something to do with my older brother, but uh, I do have a black eye, but I'm smiling, right? So that's what counts. That is, that is me on my very first day um, at Camp Dakota in 1983. I'm standing on what to me at that time was cabin 20. It is now called Leader Corps. And I have some upcoming history talks on the 13th. Um, I'm going to talk about yeah, I think those dates are right. I'm going to talk about uh, Camp Dakota and the hurricane of 1938. Believe me, you don't want to miss that one. On the 27th, myself and my research partner, a gentleman named Timothy Lang Francis, we're going to do uh, a whole dive into the lost Dakotians of the Second World War. That'll be really interesting. We're going to share some never before seen assets. And then on the 10th, I'm thinking about just, just, just being on, just doing this and we can just, I can answer any questions anyone has. I'll have all my history books surrounding me and we can all look up stuff together. So that is it. So as we say, day is done, gone the sun. Good night to Codians and thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks again so much uh, to everyone for joining us. Um, make sure to tune in to those uh, history talks in the future and tell your friends about them. Uh, if anybody missed this tonight and you hear about that, you can let them know that we'll post the video tomorrow um, on all of our social media. Uh, and other than that, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.